Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you today from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey. Absolutely delighted to welcome Elena, Alana, Alana Sernino, who is a life coach, a motivational speaker, a yin yoga teacher, and the author of Inhabit Your Joy, a book of nudges. Alana will be speaking to us from Aldi, Virginia. Alana blends her personal experiences as a cancer survivor and a teacher leader to inspire people to remove self-imposed obstacles and explore the unexpected with more curiosity, more willingness, and less judgment. Her work has been featured by Rancho La Puerta Wellness Resort and Spa, Four Seasons Hotel in Washington, DC, Tiny Buddha Productions, and the Chopra Center. I'm looking forward to talking with Alana about how cancer, then yoga, taught her to see her body as an ally instead of an enemy. The clarity that came to her when she was on a paraglider over Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Her personal mission to help people transform the walls of survival mode into doors of possibility. And her book, Inhabit Your Joy, a book of nudges, which nudges us to get rooted, get curious, and get alive. This is surely going to be a very motivating and very wise interview. Hi, Alana. Hello, Welcome. Irene. I'm so Welcome. delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be so, so interesting and so much fun. So fun. Delicious. So, fun. <laughs> so let's start with, our, with my first question for you. What was your life like before you decided to become a life coach? Mm, I was living my ideal life in a way, Irene. I had always dreamed of being an elementary school teacher, and that's what I was doing. Uh, and then I moved from teaching to writing full time. I was in a place of kind of going through the motions on the one hand, I'd had these dreams and I had achieved them and just kind of moving day after day and realizing that things had gotten a little bit stagnant perhaps. Um, but it was this, I've always been an adventurer and curiosity is my number one core value. So in many ways I was living my best life until I realized that perhaps there was more and there was a different way for me to connect to who I really was and the elements that I was always doing as a classroom teacher, as a writer of inviting people into their own journeys. So I was doing that in just different ways. <laughs> so what, what inspired you to become a life coach? So when I decided to become a life coach, I had thought about it before. I was newly remarried and I had been a teacher for 12 years. I had left teaching to do this writing and my husband's an engineer. We have spreadsheets for everything and coaching kept coming up, <laughs> right? Um, and in fact, I had been trained as a coach originally to work with my staff as a teacher, to work with struggling teachers, new teachers, parents. And I loved asking great questions and helping people find their own clarity. My students, I, when I was a third grade teacher, do you remember the game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Absolutely. Right. And you could phone a friend <laughs> when you didn't know an answer. So my students, when they didn't know an answer, could, it was before cell phones were a thing in schools, could like they had, you know, they had to hold the phone, the pretend phone with their hands and phone somebody in the classroom. And another student would give them the answer. But then the original student would have to bring it, give it back to me in their own words. And to me, as I kept being nudged, literally coaching, 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 and hearing about it and realizing that perhaps this was the thing that I was meant to do, that everything had been leading to this opportunity to ask great questions and help people find their own answers, which has been that idea of us having our own inner wisdom and being the thing we've been waiting for is, is what I'm rooted in. And so it was many things. And then I ended up being asked by an energy healer and massage therapist, have you ever thought about being a life coach? And I, or have you ever thought of life coaching? And I said, as in for me or for me, 
<laughs> she said, no, for you to be. And I had, but it was that nudge from her to help the puzzle pieces come together uh, to in part give me the the audaciousness perhaps to go to my husband and say, so I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> and the spreadsheets, let's just put them away for right now. <laughs> and he loved you so much. He said, honey, go for it. He did. He did in his own way. <laughs> He still loves his spreadsheets. And I have had many a coaching conversation with him about scarcity and what it means to live in fear. And, and he always does allow me to be curious and knows that if he doesn't, it just, it, it stagnates me. So it's much better to allow me to explore. (laughs) You're living a balance. He gets to have his spreadsheets and you get to do your thing. Correct. And now I've embraced yeah, there's knowledge and empowerment and knowing how to use a spreadsheet and what the numbers yeah, absolutely. are. Absolutely. As we need those people. <laughs> we do. We do. We and do. they need us. <laughs> we do. Yeah. So, so you had an experience where um, a doctor invited you to inhabit your joy when you found out you were pregnant. So you want to tell us about that? And what did that mean to you to inhabit your joy? Yeah. So in that moment, I'll never forget it. I was, it was a, it was a morning. It was, I was in the classroom getting my classroom ready. And I'd received this call, please call your doctor. And so I did. And he says to me that I was pregnant and I burst Irene into sobbing, sobbing tears because the reason that I was seeing that particular doctor who was a fertility specialist was that I had spent 18 months as a patient undergoing treatment for Hodgkin's disease. Oh my God. And because I had had a bone marrow transplant, my own cells, so it was autologous, this was many years ago. Transplants have come such a long way since then. But at the time, the, the knowing for sure certainty was that I would never viably be able to get pregnant on my own. And in fact, at that age, I was 28, 29, had not been able to. So we were going down the road of a donor egg. And they were actually putting my body through the pieces. We had picked out our donor egg. I was weeks away from receiving this egg. So when the doctor's news came, I was devastated because for me to be able to have produced something like this, I'd been told it would just never be viable. And so I was overcome with fear and unfairness. Or you were afraid that the the baby would never... Correct. That I was giving, being given this opportunity to have it taken away because part of what had happened was when I was diagnosed, I was on top of the world. I had just gotten newly engaged to a different man, so many stories (laughs) and, and life was good until it wasn't. It was like the other shoe was always dropping at that time in my life, or that's how it felt. And so this doctor offered me this phrase. He said, well, he let me cry thankfully. And then he said, look, you can choose to grieve or you can choose to celebrate until the day you can't. So he knew that you were going like miscarry or something. Was the, the possibility was that I could miscarry, that something would happen to this embryo and wouldn't be viable. And, and he just offered me this choice to essentially now what I call inhabit your joy, even in uncertainty, to celebrate, to be so present in the moment and not be stuck in the overthinking and the fear. And when he offered me this choice, Irene, it was instantaneous. I was like, option B, please. I knew the answer right away. And I went all in with my whole heart. And that afternoon, before I went home, I went to CVS to the grocery, um, the pharmacy and I bought a pregnancy test because I needed to see it with my own eyes. And I also bought a journal to start writing letters to this unborn grain of rice at the time, who's now 17. And we're starting to look at colleges. So you really had this amazing miracle and you had your own I child really and the whole thing. <gasps> I did the whole oh thing. And, and that to me is what inhabit your joy means. It's going all in, even when we have no idea what the outcome is going to be and giving ourselves permission to feel the ups and downs because real life, you and I were talking before we pressed recording, right? Life is not rainbows and unicorns or pixie dust outside our windows all the time. And so it's this opportunity to say, to choose, to be with what lights us up, to be with the possibilities. And so that was this moment that this, the doctor gave me this incredible gift by stating it to me so clearly, grieve, or celebrate until the day you can't. And I've never he, forgotten. Listen, he or she? 
he. It was a he. He was very wise because a lot, of, a lot of doctors, they don't have this bedside manner or they don't have this wisdom and they're very black and white about everything. Correct. It was you unbelievable. Really, what, it, a, what a, have you let him know how much that meant to you? I mean, I good have, man. I wow. Have, yeah. um, you know, I think also for me and feel free to disagree with me, um, that a lot of people see life as um, like either or. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize that you can have joy and sadness at the same time. The magic of the and. I totally agree with you, right? The and is such a powerful that we tend to think that one excludes the other. Right. And it does. I mean, if something awful is happening and something else, I can't let myself be happy because this other thing is going on. But you can, you can. experience both. You can. And that's, I think that's the practice, right? Of giving yourself, and it is a choice and it takes effort and work to be able to see and feel both. It is not a light switch that you put on once no. and you're, you're done, <laughs> but it's choosing the and, and that really perhaps is the crux of inhabiting your joy of being in it so fully, no matter what's happening around you. And it doesn't always have to look the same, right? So Yes, it's it was a gift that that doctor gave me, and you and know, what a I, gift you ended up having in the in the in your with your daughter, my daughter Samantha, who's she is a gift, <laughs> even on the days where mother daughter things. But <laughs> I'm very very lucky, oh and it, it was a gift. Alana, in what ways did cancer then yoga teach you to see your body as an ally instead of an enemy? That's another amazing concept. Well, so this was the piece, right? I had had a bone marrow transplant and the cells that were transplanted back into me, Irene, were mine. My body literally healed me. And I didn't see it at the time. I was 23, turning 24. I did not have the clarity or wisdom to put that together. You were so young. You were so young. Absolutely. And then, right, I then turned 30, not supposed to be able to have my own child. I'm supposed to need help. The, The magic happens again. And my body creates this creature, this being who then was born and, you know, cultivated inside me. And over and over again, that has been the lesson that I have gotten to keep learning that when I am out of trust with my body, I am not in alignment. But when I see my body as my ally on this journey, on this path, that that's where I step into thriving, where I show up as my best self. And I, I've learned it through yoga, right? Yoga is a perfect example because in so many of the different physical asana shapes, your body is different from right to left, from morning to evening. And so we get to practice acceptance and compassion. And that's why when we are in allyship, with our body versus the the fixing and the force of trying to make something so. Right. I hear that. Yeah. And, and it has a little bit to do with also acceptance of your body for 100% what it is and who you are also. Yes. And it, you know, I grew up, so I'm, I'm from Venice, Italy. I adore my mom. And right there, I remember there were times where she'd look at me and say, you're coming to the gym with me tomorrow or whatever it was. And I think we spent a lot of time in opposition with our bodies, thinking that it needs to be fixed, thinking that we're broken, thinking that something isn't good enough. It could be prettier. It could be this. Yeah. And both my cancer and my yoga practice and these life experiences have helped me see. And, and look, I, I'm a real person and I still have moments where I'm not in allyship with my body, but it's what I have to, what I get to come back to when I realize it, right. That if I'm not my own best friend and treating my body as such, then I'm not, I'm not going to create the healing. I I'm not open to healing at that point, that it's that seeing it as the vehicle for being in the world that helps me heal on a day-to-day basis. It's wonderful. And could you describe for us that inspiring clarity that came to you when you were on a paraglider over Jackson Hole? At at first of all, it sounds like a lot of fun. (laughs) Being on a paraglider over Jackson Hole, Wyoming, it must've been absolutely beautiful. But what was that inspiring moment that came to you at that time? So at that time, so we were in Jackson Hole for a half marathon. I was not there to paraglide and I had no idea what paragliding was. 
<laughs> and yet the very first thing that we saw on our first morning in Jackson hole, I remember having breakfast, looking out, instead of looking at the grand Tetons, all I could notice were these beautifully colored things flying down from the sky. I didn't now, even were you know there, they... well, like, were you there to ski or you were just there to visit? We were there in, it was June, early June. We were there to run a half marathon and we oh, got wow. in a few days early to acclimate to the elevation before running. And so my husband and I were having breakfast and I see these paragliders coming down and I became fascinated with them and then realized what they were and then inquired, how can I do that too? <laughs> and this was the experience that I think to me, all the puzzle pieces came together because eventually when I did get to fly on, you know, several days later and the pilot, we run off the mountain and I, you know, I'm with the pilot. So I'm, I'm just kind of there and taking it all in and you're soaring above the village, you're at eye level with the birds, there is this vastness and the sense of just expansive freedom. And then the pilot says to me, it's your turn to steer. Ooh. And I said, I don't know that that's such a great idea. We <laughs> <laughs> think this. And what he said to me was that all that needed to happen was that I needed to turn a finger super slowly and that that's what would help us change direction. This very subtle, in fact, no big movements because big movements, not good apparently when paragliding, right? You're going to not can be with the wind and that it was this subtle movement. And this realization came to me that so often we think that to transform our lives, we need to blow things up. We need to, you know, go in a hundred, turn 180 degrees. And really it's those subtle shifts that over time move us into the direction that we want to go, that we're meant to go. And by the time between taking off and then landing my feet on the ground in the village, Everything had come together. That was actually the weekend that cemented my questioning of would I go into life coaching? It all came together of I could help people experience this to create their own small shifts. One so your step small shifts are inch by inch and those are your nudges. Those are the nudges. Those okay. are the nudges. I got it. I got <laughs> it. So let's talk about your personal mission to help people transform the walls of survival mode into those doors of possibility and how, and describe how you coach people through those, those nudges. Yeah. You know, I mentioned that I was a cancer survivor and for those 18 months, I was focused solely on survival. And then I realized that there actually had to be something more <laughs> because when I was so focused on survival, I was numb to everything else. And so I moved from thinking that survival was the only thing to moving to breaking down walls and finding these doors of possibility, new chapters, right? Whatever it is we want to call them, but really thriving in the moment into this aliveness. And when I do that with the amazing clients that I have, we start from this perspective of, you know, I, I read, I was introduced to a mantra um, last year when I was in Costa Rica, the more grounded you are, the higher you can fly. And that put all of my experiences together because for in all the work that I've done, it's always been, so let's start with the foundation, with your roots. Who are you? What makes you you? What is unique to you? What are those limiting beliefs that have somehow, they become like the bricks in that aren't supposed to be in the soil, right? We built a new house um, three years ago and when we're doing work in the yard, we still find, you know, concrete that is there that shouldn't be there. Right, right. <laughs> It's this idea of what is in your foundation. So we start there. What makes you, you? And then we begin to think about, all right, so what is it that you could be curious about, right? What new doors might you even begin to name? Because part of what gets in our way is that we say we are not sure of what we want, of who we are, of, of all of these pieces, right? But let's just pretend that we did know and start getting curious about that. And then we move into embodying or inhabiting 
this version of ourselves. So how do we begin to show up as that version of ourselves every single day? And one of my favorite things to do with my clients, it actually comes from my work as a third grade teacher when I taught my students about Greek mathematicians. <laughs> and we created these large stick figures and they had to read about these Greek mathematicians and then teach these mathematicians to the rest of the class. And I had them create these very large stick figures on big, big paper about all the different parts of their lives. And I remember I was actually getting ready to lead a workshop at Rancho La Puerta in Mexico. And I realized I could put these things together. And so now I use this truest self stick figure that I created to think about what's in your roots. What are you lifted by? What are the things that this version of you sees and says? What are the resources, the practices that are you use, right? What are the to-dos that you do on a daily basis? What do you love? What is your why? Your inner fire. So it puts all of this together and gives people their own personal definition of how to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis. That's beautiful. You just answered the, another question, but I want to ask you about get, when you, when you nudge people to get rooted, get curious and get alive and what it means to get rooted, which you're talking about, but do they, do people sometimes need to revise a little bit the way they have been rooted? Like Absolutely. sometimes they, sometimes those roots have been fed by some dysfunction or society, families of origin, right. expectations. So they're not on completely solid roots as they're trying to fly, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I often talk about, you know, what are your truths versus, versus the truths that you've subscribed to from right. somebody else for whatever reason. And, and sometimes some of those truths have served us until they don't anymore. And so it becomes this opportunity. I always, you know, one of the things that I do on a regular basis is this idea of excavating, unearthing, right? What's in my foundation? Does anything need to be shored up, <laughs> re-strengthened? And so, yes, going back and really thinking about, and to me, the roots, I think about them as, um, well, a client once said to me that this work helped her feel like a redwood tree. And I said, say more. <laughs> And she said, well, I can be jostled, but unmoved. Wow. And it was this idea of being rooted. I have since learned, Irene, and I don't know if you know this. I did not know this, that redwood trees do not have deep roots. They have shallow roots that are all interconnected. But for, so for a long time, I went around saying, you know, deep roots. And then somebody very sciencey said to me, actually, that's not accurate. He went, huh. okay. But, I, but I, I also love the idea the, of the interconnectedness of our roots, right? The things that make us us are not, you know, one thing over here and another, they're not isolated. They are, right. of course, interconnected. Of course, right, it's fascinating. So the other thing I wanna ask, another thing I wanna ask you is you talk about in your book, which I truly enjoy, about a brain dump mm. and how that can be helpful in grounding us. You wanna explain that to us? Yeah, so, I started adopting a brain dump based on the work of Julia Cameron and the artist way, where she talks about the morning pages as a way to cultivate creativity. And I recognized that as I was doing that on a regular basis, I was also decluttering my brain. <laughs> I was taking all the stuff that's in there that a lot of us would like to ignore or shove away or pretend, you know, for all the things judge. But instead, if I could allow whatever's in my brain to exist, even for a moment, for enough time for it to go on paper, then suddenly I had space. So it was mental and emotional, honestly, decluttering. And so to me, a brain dump has become one of my go-to practices to give myself permission to be present because part of what keeps us from being present is this idea of all everything that's in the past, right? All of the drama. All the stuff going. Do you often write it down to expel it, or yes, you have different methods that you help writing people? it down. So to me, a brain dump. I only have two rules: it has to be written, and there's no censoring of yourself as you write it. Because if you're censoring, then you're in your brain. You're thinking about it, right? And I am Irene. True confession: an Olympic level overthinker and <laughs> catastrophizer. <laughs> so. A brain dump is real for me. I, and I do it almost every day. It doesn't, it could be five minutes. It could be two minutes. It could be 30 minutes, but it's the idea of taking whatever's there, putting it on paper, 
so that you don't have to hold on to it quite so tightly anymore. And that helps us be present. Sure. It makes all, it makes you more aware of what you really yes. see too. So I think, I think, and tell me about energy hygiene mm. and why is tending to our energy hygiene an important way to say yes to ourselves? Yeah. So do you perhaps remember the book, Harold and the Purple Crayon? This Not is an really. old school picture book where this young, this young boy, Harold had a purple crayon and he drew these scenes that then he would step into. And I love this idea of creating space for us, saying yes to you. And what I found is that we give our energy away a lot, right? When we show up with our families, out in the world, right? We take on other people's energy. We become what other people want of us. And we stop saying yes to ourselves, to our needs, to our desires, to our wants, right? All of these things. And so energy hygiene is this idea of almost creating this energetic boundary to keep what matters inside. So it's less, I mean, we think about boundaries often as the things we want to keep out, And that's true too, but I often think about when we really tend to our energy hygiene, we are insulating ourselves with what it is we want to keep in. And so I have a few different ways that, and I always give people a choice because it's about making work for you, right? So you can pretend you have a gold or I I love purple, but a gold or a purple crayon and literally imagine drawing a boundary around your entire body. So it moves with you. So that's one way. The other, because I love to be a child, apparently is imagining that you're blowing a big bubble, not the little ones that, you know, you get the little, the little sets, but imagine that you have a big, big bubble wand and you can blow a bubble that is big enough to fit around you. It walks with you. And what I love about that is that it's fluid, Right. So it bends a little bit. It pushes out sometimes and sometimes it bursts and then we get to blow the bubble again. We get to choose. So to me, this energy hygiene is tending to what you want to create space for. And when you do that, you are saying yes to yourself. That's a beautiful concept. And why do you suggest we replace trying to improve or fix our lives with a curious mindset? That's interesting because a lot of people go to therapy and go to different things to to supposedly fix themselves. Yeah. So the trouble with fixing, and there are certain things that need to be fixed in the world, in, right? If you're bleeding, please put on a (laughs) Band-Aid. Internally or physically or whatever. Absolutely. 100%. And I think that so often we go into this mindset, to this place in our brain and in ourselves that believes that we're not enough, that we have to be, we're broken. And sometimes that feels very true. And yet when we are in that place, it's really hard to see possibility. And my sense is that when we're in that fixing place, all of these solutions we come up with, with are temporary right? They're, they're the short fix versus the long-term transformation that we're really craving. When we lead with curiosity, so less judgment, more curiosity, wondering what could be possible. That's where I've seen both with myself and with the clients that I work with, creating the possibilities and the steps to move forward rather than staying in that quick stand of the fixing. So it's this idea of offering yourself self-compassion, acceptance, noticing. I think about it oftentimes in yoga when if you're, or any time that you ever feel an ache in your body, right? Cause we do, our body likes to talk to us. Yeah. <laughs> and we, and we tend to label it as, oh, I'm tight or I must've done this, right? I did something wrong, but I sometimes, and this was, I think the first access point. Do I hear a little judgment? I must've done something wrong. Absolutely. Right. Right. So what if we could see those sensations as benevolent messengers of saying, hey, you're alive. Here's what I want you to know. Maybe I need a little bit of nurturing, right? Nourishment versus this thing that has to be fixed. So it goes back to seeing the body as an ally, for instance, is that example, right? Right. Oh, that's interesting. And how, 
And what does our inner landscape have to do with being curious about aspects of our lives? Mm. And how do you personally self-nourish using delight and curiosity? Yeah. So when we're gardening outside, right, before we plant seeds, bulbs, plants, anything, we have to nourish the soil first. We have to, you know, make sure the soil is good. We have to take out the weeds, the rocks, the whatever it is. Our inner landscape is the same way. It's this idea of how can we tend to it? So are there mindsets? Are there beliefs? Are there patterns that perhaps we've gotten stuck with, right? That have become clutter, have become the weeds. I don't know about you. um, I've become a gardener in the last few years. And it is amazing to me how quickly weeds grow, (laughs) right? I mean, it is amazing. I will go out and spend an hour in my garden one day and two days later, I'm like, this is exactly where I was. I've experienced that. Absolutely. (laughs) So it's that same thing of, could we tend to our inner landscape? What the messages of our heart, our breath, our body, the, the wisdom, the intuition that's inside with curiosity versus force or judgment or fixing, Right. And so it's this, I wonder what will happen if I, if I remove this weed, right. And, and I've started now to see weeds as growth. <laughs> like I'm just going to see it as an opportunity to pay attention. And so for me, the self-nourishment is I is breath work, right. The things that help me self-nourish are coming in, noticing my heartbeat. So it doesn't even matter. It could be two minutes. It could be five. It could be 30, but hand my one hand over heart, another over my belly and breathing and becoming aware of my heartbeat. That's the first way that I tend to my inner landscape every day to just remind myself of the fact that I'm alive and I am breathing. And I have this ability to be my own inner wellspring. Hmm. And then I can ask myself a question like, what is the message of my heart today? Or what do I need to know today? So then it comes into the curiosity, right? Of allowing things to emerge. It's almost like you embrace yourself every day. Yeah. 100. Yes. Self-love. And what does gratitude have to do with the sense of being alive? Mm. Which would be my favorite subject. So yes. Well, (laughs) You know, when we are filled up, nourished, I see gratitude as nourishment, as fuel, right? So when we are filled up with things that we are grateful for, we are able to, it's it's like when we plug in our phones to be charged, it's our internal charging system that then helps us be alive in our life. It helps us embrace being in the moment and open to what's here. It's harder to do that when we feel depleted. And I find that gratitude is that thing that helps us fill up on a daily basis. My first gratitude practice was actually a breath practice to help me go to sleep years ago. And I remember learning, you know, about sleep routines and different things. And so it was at bedtime, I would take six breaths. And with each breath, I had to think of one thing I was grateful for. Right. And it could be anything. It could be you know, the sun shining that day or the fact that my husband had gone to the grocery store, anything, but it filled me up over Mm -hmm. the years. My practices have changed, but it's this idea of allowing your heart to be filled and expand, which then sets us up to better, to not be as reactive, right. To be more present, to be more open, to receive whatever it is that might be there for us. I totally resonate with that. And what is, Alana, what is determination with that expectation? Mm. That's another of your concepts that we're. Yeah. Well, so let me ask, I'll I'll turn the question to you. Have you ever set a goal and been particularly grippy or forceful about what it had to look like when you got there? Sure. But then you realize what control do you have and you have to kind of go with that. Yeah. Right. So this is something I've realized over the years that expectations are my kryptonite. (laughs) And my antidote is curiosity, actually. But this this phrase, determination without expectation, came to me. It was given to me by a surf instructor 
total young surfer dude um, in Panama, I had gone, I decided I wanted to learn to surf. And I'd had this revelation when I was traveling with my husband and we saw this uh, group of kids taking surf lessons. And this young girl with long brown hair and a blue rash guard was coming out of the water. And the expression on her face, Irene, was pride and joy like I had never seen. And I'm looking to my husband and I said, I want to feel like that. He was like, what? It was a little bit like the paragliding. He kind of said to me, you're bananas. <laughs> um, and I said, I want to do, I want to look like that. You're very adventurous. You're very adventurous. I am. I am. You really are. But so then expectations set in. So I found a surf retreat. I was going to go. I went, but I had in my mind what surfing looked like, right? It looked like standing on a surfboard, arms out, that expression. Well, we go out the first day and I don't look like that (laughs) by any stretch of the imagination. I never even get, you know, I pretty much stay on my belly or on my knees the whole time on the surfboard. And afterwards I was in tears. I I also cry a lot, apparently. (laughs) And the surf instructor and I started chatting later and he said, look, so what would happen tomorrow if you went out there with determination, right? You're going to show up, go all in instead of expectation." And I said, well, that would be interesting. So what might you notice? And when I had no idea what I would notice, he said, so did you pay attention to the fact today that you're an amazing paddler? Meaning every time I would not catch the wave or catch the wave, but not standing and then have to go back out, I was a really good paddler or that I was indeed actually catching the energy of the water and moving with it, just not upright. So determination without expectation helps you, right? Be present with what's there. We come back to this being present without being so bogged down by what it has to look like. That makes a lot of sense. And talk to me about what is in your mind, a soft place to land. Mm -hmm. And how does that work with one of your grudges, with your nudges, not grudges, nudges. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) right so a soft place to land we often we are made to connect with others right we are made to be in relationship in community and connection with others and I find that sometimes we seek out others or external things for that for those comforts for that compassion for that sense of allowing and acceptance. And so this idea of being your own soft place to land is, is being your own best friend is being that warm hug, right? For instance, even wearing sometimes, um, I have a shawl on that I bought recently, but sometimes I'll wear a shawl that was my grandmother's. And when I put that over me, it's like a warm hug. And it's that idea of giving that nourishment to yourself just because. Just because. And, just because, because you deserve it, right? Right. Even just doing this with your hands, but this idea of just because, and that is this idea of being your own soft place to land. And it's something that I come back to often for myself with my clients, because we have to give ourselves permission to be that thing that we've been waiting for, right? Instead of always craving it from somebody else. And And I think being your own soft place to land helps you actually receive from others as well, because you're filled up and not expecting or needing it from somebody else. Right. And as as needy from the rest of the world, because you're providing so much for yourself. And what do you call the sunrise in your pocket? I love the I love the visual of that. And how do you help people find that for themselves? Yeah. So sunrise in your pocket to me, I love the sunrise. I'm a a sunrise girl. Sunsets are beautiful. But to me, the sunrise is all about curiosity, right? You, it's literally darkness to sunrise. This light comes up and you never know what it's going to look like. Sometimes it's cloudy. You don't actually see the sun coming up. Sometimes it looks like cotton candy. Sometimes it's bright and full, bold and fiery, right? But it's this idea of we don't actually question or doubt that the fact that the sun is rising, even when we can't see it. So being the sunrise in your pocket is reminding ourselves that we have the inner wisdom, we have the inner strength, the the knowing to be 
everything we need, even when we're not sure what that looks like or means, even on the days that feel gray. Wow. Yeah. And it, it came to me honestly, because the very, one of the first things I remember after my daughter was born was the morning after she was in the room with me and the sun, the sun was rising and the light was coming in through the windows. And I just remember her being there in my arms and this feeling of possibility that emerged from that. So when I work with my clients and, and how they inhabit that is really leaning into, okay, I don't know what this is going to look like. In fact, I had a client once who planted mystery seeds. She got a packet of seeds. She had no idea what they were. So for her kind of playing with this idea of sunrise in your pocket and curiosity and possibility was planting these mystery seeds and tending to them and just being surprised at what grew. In fact, they're still growing two years later. Wow. 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 (laughs) That's beautiful. But I'm sure that were they flowers? They were flowers. Well, they were, um, they were flowers that I think were because they keep coming. They must've been perennials or what, what are the ones that keep growing perennials? Yeah, 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 great. And I know that you have these wonderful retreats and it sounds to me like that anyone who goes to one of your wonderful retreats is going to be so exhilarated and so inspired. So why don't you tell us about your retreats? And I know that you've got a special one coming up this June. I do. So I do. share, share girl. I, so retreats for me are where we come together as a community and we create, we come as individuals and we create. Now, do they physically come? Is it a physical retreat? So this particular one in June, Inhabit Your Joy Live is in person in the Virginia area, but I've been leading virtual retreats and I will still continue to lead virtual retreats. And actually I have great fun leading virtual retreats. And a client once said to me, I have no idea how you did it, but it felt like we were shoulder to shoulder around the fire, which was the best, com- you know, it was just such a sense of, of pride for me. So Inhabit Your Joy Live will be June 11th, uh, 2022 in Lovettsville, Virginia, in the Northern Virginia area. And this is a day to really come together as individuals and in connection to step into getting rooted, curious, and alive. We will be practicing yin yoga in the morning. I have a guest instructor who will lead groove sessions throughout the day. And if you've never- What's a groove groove, session? What's a groove session? Groove is- Dance meets yoga meets your five and oh, skipping fine. around a playground. <laughs> it is total freedom, non-choreographed. It is beautiful, just embodiment, right? Allowing the music to move you. And really this idea of connecting to the possibilities within you. So we will be looking at whatever brick walls we've created and seeing where we can create windows or doors <laughs> through those walls to step into the remainder of 2022 and beyond. That's fabulous. And how long will this event last? It will be a, this will be a one day retreat. Um, so it'll be Saturday, June 11th. Uh, morning until afternoon. And there will be an opportunity for some VIP for a VIP experience in the evening with a beautifully curated um, dinner uh, out in, as a picnic. It'll be tremendous and delicious. <laughs> and my hope is that that experience kind of creates a mid-year reset for people, right? To really step in and it's summer. So this idea of what's growing, what, what can you allow to expand? It's also the weekend of my of my second birthday, my bone marrow anniversary, which I, I celebrate as a birthday. It's June 12th is my, my bone marrow birthday. So we'll be doing some celebrating. <laughs> That's wonderful. And what a wonderful gift you give yourself with that. Yes. And tell us how are the best ways for people to connect with you? Because yes. I'm sure they're so, going to want to find, you know, sign up for your retreat, get your book of nudges and all of that. So how do they Connect. Absolutely. Well, the first way is they can go to, I have a free download that they can receive to actually practice filling up on gratitude in your body. Uh, and they can go to sunriseinyourpocket.com backslash find your joy. And that'll put you also on my list to get information about the retreats. You can, of course, go to my website at elenasanino.com. So E L E N. Right. Wait, wait. Yeah. Start again. E L E N A. E-L-E-N-A-S-O-N-N-I-N-O.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at my name, Elena Sanino. And I would be honored and delighted to connect. 
Okay. And the actual retreat is going to be called Sunrise in Your Pocket? It will be called Inhabit Your Joy Live. Okay. Inhabit Your Joy Live. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what is the Elena Sonino message about the importance of healing mm. that you'd like to share with all of our audience? It's that our inner healing is inside of us. And it starts from our body when we connect to that inner wisdom and what we know for sure, which comes from that place deep inside you. It doesn't come from the outside. A lot of people can help us on our journeys, but to me, healing starts inside when we allow ourselves to connect with that wellspring that is always with us every step we take. You just have to learn to identify it, right? And to yeah, it. and get out of our way long enough, right? You and I were joking. I broke my wrist uh, about a month ago. And the wrist for me to heal this meant reconnecting with trusting my body instead of pushing it, right? Which I talk about all the time. And yet it was this extra little exclamation point of, do you really? <laughs> and allowing it to heal on so its what own. What would you say? What's the difference between what you would be doing if you were pushing as opposed to trusting? So pushing was, I should be better by now. When is, when am I going to be able to put weight on this? Maybe I can try this, right? Of, of really forcing against it, wishing it weren't so to allowing this and saying, so this is what's happened to my wrist, right? How can I work with it and offer it the time it needs to heal mm -hmm. versus constantly being, being frustrated that it hasn't healed faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Elena, your important tip for finding joy in life, what would that be? My important tip for finding joy in life is to allow yourself to, dis to explore what would feel delicious to you in your heart, in your soul, in that place that just touches you. What is it that would feel delicious and light you up and practice that in small steps one day at a time. And the more you do that, the more joy that you will cultivate and experience. That's beautiful. And I must say, it's been a joy interviewing you. I want to thank you for motivating people to open to self-awareness so that they can thrive with more curiosity, purpose, and delight. Mm -hmm. Eleanor, it's wonderful. And I encourage everyone in our Grief and Rebirth audience to go to your website and learn more about your uplifting retreat this June. The name of it again? Inhabit Your Joy Live. And I thank you from my heart. Thank you, Irene. It was a very inspiring and very wise interview. And here's a reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all grief and rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And be sure to subscribe to Grief and Rebirth Podcast on YouTube. Like, subscribe, and hit notify so that you'll get all these inspiring and insightful new interviews coming your way. As I like to say, to be continued. Many blessings. And bye for now. Mm -hmm.